there. You found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Have you ever traveled to the kingdom of dreamland? Lots of yeses, Bear. Many are saying they're in dreamland every night when they're asleep. Well, right now, Noah is taking off to dreamland, where the king wants him to fight a dragon who's setting dreamland on fire. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see if Noah will obey the king and slay the fire-breathing dragon. Noah in Dreamland by Alana George. I jump into bed as my mom dims the light. She picks out a book as I smile with delight. She tucks in the blanket beneath my cold toes and starts to read, but my eyes slowly close. Dream of aqua blue water and beaches with sand. Good night, little Noah. I'll see you in dreamland. My eyes feel quite heavy as I drift off to sleep. When suddenly I hear a strange kind of creak. My eyes fly open and to the left of the door, my rocking chair is rising right off of the floor. Not wasting a second, I leap onto the chair and suddenly realize I'm up in the air. Take me to dreamland, I order out loud and fly out of my window and straight through a cloud past shimmering stars and beyond the white moon, when suddenly my chair and I land with a boom. And before I have time to look around, a funny old man in a red robe and crown says, Noah, young man, we've been waiting for you. In fact, your visit is long overdue. We need your help. Dreamland has some trouble. Follow me, Noah. Hop, skip on the double. I say to the king, you've been waiting for me? And you need my help? Whatever can it be? There's a terrible dragon who is burning our city. We've begged him to stop, but he will not take pity. I loudly gasp, but what can I do? You will slay the dragon. We're counting on you. So I follow the king and he hands me a sword and a silvery shield that is hard as a board. The dragon's this way. The king gives me a poke. You really can't miss him. Just follow the smoke. So I follow his orders and trek through the town looking for embers fiery red and burnt brown. And that's when I see him, almighty and giant. I pull out my sword. He seems quite defiant. Oh, please don't hurt me, the big dragon pled. His nose was quite runny and stuffy and red. I'm feeling quite sick and don't mean to sneeze flames. It turns out that I just have 
terrible aim. I'd never hurt Dreamland or anger the throne. I do love this kingdom. This kingdom's my home. So I stood for a moment and had a quick thought. This dragon did not need to be fought. I ran to the castle and ordered some tea and a big bowl of soup, super hot and spicy. I brought it straight over to the poor sickly dragon who gulped it right down as fast as you can imagine. I did not mean to scare you. I felt awfully blue. It appears, said the dragon, that I just had the flu. All hail Noah, the king loudly did shout, for saving our kingdom and helping us out. Then the king took my hand and gave me his crown to the new king of Dreamland. You saved the whole town. I smiled and thanked him, but twas time to go home, and I asked the dragon to watch over the throne. Will I see you tomorrow? I heard the dragon say. Yes, and got in my rocking chair and flew far away. Now safely back home with the crown on my chair, I snuggled in bed with my soft teddy bear and dreamt of aqua blue water and beaches with sand and the exciting adventure I had in dreamland. Bear's wondering, how did Noah find out the dragon didn't mean to burn dreamland? Hmm. Many are saying Noah listened to the dragon explain his story. So Bear's asking, what do you think kings should do first? Listen to the whole story or fight? Most say listen. Well, what do you think King Noah will do? Hmm. Well, Bear's hoping you come back soon for more adventures in getting the whole story. Bye for now. Please subscribe. there you found us here at story time with miss becky i'm miss becky and this is our friend bear who loves to read along with you bear has a question for you do you ever miss someone who does not live near you yes a few do bear well beanie's grandmother nani lives on the other side of the world and Beanie really wishes she could talk to Nani every day. But Beanie's daytime is Nani's nighttime. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see if Beanie can figure out a way to send messages to Nani every day. Nani's Moon, written by Julia Incero. It was bedtime. The moon was up and Beanie's mom was tucking her in. I miss Nani, said Beanie. Me too, said mom. It's hard living far away from people we love. Can we call her, asked Beanie. Absolutely, let's call her in the morning. That will be her bedtime. Why is it her bedtime in the morning? Beanie asked. Because she lives on the other side of the world. 
So when the sun is rising and waking us up, the moon is coming up for Nani. Giving her a kiss and a big squeeze, mom said, good night, Beanie. I love you to pieces and pieces. In the morning, Beanie got dressed and ate breakfast as quickly as she could. Ring, ring. I miss you, Nani, Beanie said before Nani could even say hello. I miss you too, dear, laughed Nani. What are you going to do today? I have school with Miss Holla. We are painting. That sounds fun, said Nani. When can we see you again? Oh, it will be a while, said Nani. I will see you at Christmas. But I want to see you every day, said Beanie. Let's think about it. I bet there's some way we can send a message to each other every day. The next morning, Beanie jumped out of bed. She raced downstairs. Mom, Dad, I have an idea, she said. But before she could share it, the phone rang. Good morning, Beanie, Nani said. I thought and thought about how we could send a message every day, and I think I found a solution. Nani, I have an idea too. The moon, they said at the same time. Laughing, Nani said, I looked up and saw the moon tonight. It was so big and bright that I couldn't stop staring. And then I thought, Beanie gets to see the exact same moon. Yes, Beanie said, I saw it too. So when I go to bed tonight, I can send you a message through the moon said Nani. Then later, when you see the moon, you can send a message back to me. That sounds great, said Beanie. Aren't we smart, said Nani. Beanie laughed. Beanie was so excited to get Nani's message she could barely concentrate at school. Following dinner and books, Beanie raced upstairs to get ready for bed. Slow down, Beanie, said Mom. Brush your teeth. But I have to get Nani's message, said Beanie. I know, said Mom, but her message will still be there after you've brushed your teeth properly. Beanie finished brushing and got into her pajamas. Let's look at the moon, she said, as she climbed up to the window. Do you see a message? asked Mom. I don't know, said Beanie. It just looks like the moon. How about this, suggested Mom. Close your eyes and think of Nani. What would she say? Beanie closed her eyes and sat quietly. Can you hear her? Shh, said Beanie. I am listening. After a few minutes, Beanie smiled. She said she loves me and she misses me a lot. It worked, laughed Mom. That's great. Now let's send her one back. But how do I do that? asked Beanie. Well, let's close our eyes again and imagine Nani standing right in front of us. What would you say? Beanie thought for a moment and said, I love you and I miss you. 
I drew a picture of a kitty for you. Opening her eyes, she asked, is that good? That was wonderful, said mom. Then she gave her a kiss and a squeeze and said, I love you to pieces and pieces. Nani's going to be so excited to get your message. Beanie fell into a deep sleep, and before she knew it, she was waking up to the rising sun. Again, she raced downstairs. Can we call Nani to see if she got my message? She asked. Let's finish eating breakfast, and then we can call her, said Mom. Ring, ring. Nani, did you get my message? Did you hear that I drew you a kitty? Nani laughed. I was brushing my teeth and I saw the moon. I closed my eyes and I could hear your voice. It was wonderful. I couldn't stop smiling. And I can't wait to see the kitty picture, she said. It worked, yelled Beanie. Let's do this again. I can't wait to go to bed tonight. Nani laughed. Enjoy your day and have fun at school. Bedtime will come soon enough. I will send you another message tonight. That day at school, Beanie showed Miss Hala a picture she had drawn. This is Nani's moon, said Beanie. This is how we send messages to each other. I tell her I love her and miss her. And she tells me she loves me too. What a fabulous idea, said Miss Hala. Maybe I could do the same with my sister who lives far away. Oh yes, said Beanie. All you have to do is look at the moon and close your eyes and talk. When your sister sees the moon, if she listens very closely, she will hear you. After dinner that night, Beanie chose three books and Daddy read all of them. Beanie then went to get ready for bed. Mom! Dad! Come quick! yelled Beanie. Mom ran into the room. What's wrong? It's Nani's moon! It's gone! Beanie began to cry. What do you mean it's gone? asked Mom. Look, said Beanie, it's not in the sky. Mom looked out the window. It was a cloudy night and there were no stars and no moon to be seen. What are we going to do? How can I send her a message? Mom smiled. Even though you can't see it, the moon is always there. Tonight it's hiding behind some clouds. But you can still send your message, and I bet you will hear Nani's as well. Beanie didn't think her mom was telling the truth, but she was willing to give it a try. Sit here with me, and let's see if we can hear Nani. Beanie climbed up into mom's lap and sat quietly. Do you hear anything? Mom whispered. No, said Beanie. How about now? Yes, I can hear her. She says she loves me and she loved talking to us on the phone. And she said her cat Pookie did something funny. That's wonderful, said Mom. See how amazing the moon is? It's just like Nani's love. Even if you can't see it every day, it will always be with you. That makes me very happy. Me too, said Mom, and she gave Beanie an extra tight squeeze. Bear's wondering, did you know we all see the moon? no matter where we live? 
Now you know? Well, Bear's wanting to send a message to his polar bear friends far away near the North Pole. What will you say, Bear? He says he'll ask them to look at the moon, close their eyes, and talk to him. Then he will listen very closely to what they say and send them a message back. Bear's also hoping you come back soon for more adventures and staying in touch. Bye for now. Please subscribe. Hi there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Have you ever wanted to go out in the moonlight on a winter adventure? Many brave yeses, Bear. Well, Bear's asking if you would walk quietly along with him into the snowy woods to find a great horned owl. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and go on an owling adventure. Sometimes you find one, sometimes you don't. Ready? Let's go. Owl Moon by Jane Yolen. It was late one winter night, long past my bedtime, when Pa and I went owling. There was no wind. The trees stood still as giant statues, and the moon was so bright the sky seemed to shine. Somewhere behind us a train whistle blew, long and low like a sad, sad song. I could hear it through the woolen cap Pa had pulled down over my ears. A farm dog answered the train, and then a second dog joined in. They sang out, trains and dogs, for a real long time. And when their voices faded away, it was as quiet as a dream. We walked on toward the woods, Pa and I. Our feet crunched over the crisp snow, and little gray footprints followed us. Pa made a long shadow but mine was short and round. I had to run after him every now and then to keep up. And my short, round shadow bumped after me. But I never called out. If you go owling, you have to be quiet. That's what Pa always says. I had been waiting to go owling with Pa for a long, long time. We reached the line of pine trees, black and pointy against the sky, and Pa held up his hand. I stopped right where I was and waited. He looked up as if searching the stars, as if reading a map up there. The moon made his face into a silver mask. Then he called. Hoo, 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 hoo. The sound of a great horned owl. Hoo, 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 hoo. Again he called out, and then again. 
After each call, he was silent, and for a moment we both listened. But there was no answer. Pa shrugged, and I shrugged. I was not disappointed. My brothers all said, "Sometimes there's an owl, and sometimes there isn't." We walked on. I could feel the cold, as if someone's icy hand was palmed down on my back, and my nose and the tops of my cheeks felt cold and hot at the same time. But I never said a word. If you go owling, you have to be quiet and make your own heat. We went into the woods. The shadows were the blackest things I had ever seen. They stained the white snow. My mouth felt furry, for the scarf over it was wet and warm. I didn't ask what kinds of things hid behind black trees in the middle of the night. When you go owling, you have to be brave. Then we came to a clearing in the dark woods. The moon was high above us. It seemed to fit exactly over the center of the clearing, and the snow below it was whiter than the milk in a cereal bowl. I sighed, and Pa held up his hand at the sound. I put my mittens over the scarf, over my mouth, and listened hard. And then Pa called, "Who, who, 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 who?" I listened and looked so hard my ears hurt. And my eyes got cloudy with the cold. Pa raised his face to call out again, but before he could open his mouth, an echo came threading its way through the trees. Hoo, 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 hoo. Pa almost smiled. Then he called back. Hoo hoo, hoo 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 hoo, just as if he and the owl were talking about supper, or about the woods, or the moon, or the cold. I took my mitten off the scarf, off my mouth, and I almost smiled too. The owl's call came closer, from high up in the trees, on the edge of the meadow. Nothing in the meadow moved. All of a sudden, an owl shadow, part of the big tree shadow, lifted off and flew right over us. We watched silently, with heat in our mouths. The heat of all those words we had not spoken. The shadow hooted again. Pa turned on his big flashlight and caught the owl, just as it was landing on a branch. For one minute, three minutes, maybe even a hundred minutes. We stared at one another. Then the owl pumped its great wings and lifted off the branch, like a shadow without sound. It flew back into the forest. Time to go home, Pa said to me. I knew then I could talk. I could even laugh out loud, but 
I was a shadow as we walked home. When you go owling, you don't need words or warm or anything but hope. That's what Pa says, the kind of hope that flies on silent wings under a shining owl moon. Bear's wondering, were you hoping you'd see a great horned owl? Yes? Did you ever think you might stop hoping and turn around? Sometimes? Well, Bear wonders why you kept going. Hmm. Many say they wanted to find one so much, Bear. Well, Bear's glad you never gave up hope because we finally found the owl. Bear's also hoping you come back soon for more adventures in staying hopeful. Bye for now. Please subscribe. You found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Have you ever wished you could get your body to do what you see others doing? Lots of yeses, Bear. Some say they wish they could balance on a bike or kick a ball really far. Well, Pint-sized Penguin Pete is watching others and trying very hard to do amazing things, too. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see what Pete will do. Penguin Pete by Marcus Pfister Once upon a time, there was a colony of penguins living happily together in the Antarctic. The youngest penguin was called Pete. He was so small that the other penguins called him pint-sized Pete. Don't worry, said Pete's mother. All penguins are pint-sized when they're young. One day, you'll grow bigger, and then you'll be able to swim in the sea with the rest of us. Pete thought the grown-up penguins looked beautiful swimming in the sea. He wanted to grow up fast so he could join them. But when the penguins came back in the evening and waddled clumsily to their nesting places, Pete couldn't help laughing. <laughs> they looked so funny. Grown-up penguins couldn't move about on snow and ice any better than pint-sized Pete. I'll show them a penguin can move gracefully on land, said Pete to himself. And he began practicing flipper skating every day. It was great fun. He slid about all over the ice and usually ended up on the ground with a thump. Now and then, some of the other penguins who were Pete's friends stayed home with him. Then they had a wonderful time playing hide and seek, making snow penguins, and having snowball fights. The time flew by. One day, a flock of birds landed on the patch of ice where the penguins lived, calling and screeching and flapping their wings. Pete marched proudly through the rows of birds. How tiny they were! He felt very big and grown up. Hello, said one of the little birds. What kind of funny bird are you? I'm a penguin, he 
he said. My name's Pete. Pleased to meet you, Pete, said the little bird. My name's Steve. Let's have a flying race. Don't be silly, said Pete. I can't fly. Then it's time you learned, said Steve. All you have to do is flap your wings hard. Just watch me. It's quite easy. Pete tried and tried to fly, but he couldn't. He could only jump a little way into the air. Pete and Steve were soon great friends, even if they couldn't go flying together. But Pete wanted nothing better than to fly with his friend. Although he tried to take off over and over again, his flights always ended in a crash landing. The day came when the flock of birds had to move on. There was nothing Steve could do about it. As the two friends said goodbye, big penguin tears trickled down Pete's cheeks. Never mind, Pete, Steve called back as he flew away. I'm sure we'll be landing on this patch of ice again next year. Pete was very sad. But his mother knew how to cheer him up. The next morning, he was allowed to go swimming in the sea for the first time. He was very excited, though the thought of diving into the water head first was rather scary. But Pete found two ledges of ice at the water's edge. He climbed calm cautiously down the ledges and slid backwards into the sea. I'll do a proper dive tomorrow, thought Pete. Pete's first few strokes were rather clumsy, but soon he was gliding through the cold water like an eel. He could even do a backstroke. He came in last in most of the swimming races, and he lost when the penguins played games. But Pete was a good loser. He never tired of looking at all the fish and seaweed. There was something new around the corner of every rock. What a wonderful, mysterious place the sea was. The moon had risen by the time Pete waddled happily back to his mother. He felt far too tired to tell her about all his adventures, but that could wait until tomorrow. He fell asleep at once and dreamed of Steve, the sea, and the dive he was going to do next day. Bear's wondering, do you think Pete will ever be able to use his flippers to fly? Nose Bear, <laughs> they say his flippers won't fly up. Well, will Steve be able to use his wings to swim underwater? Nose Bear, they say bird's wings won't fly down underwater. So, now Bear's asking, do you think Pete and Steve will always have something different to tell each other about? Well, Bear's hoping you come back soon for more adventures in finding out what you do best. Bye for now. Please subscribe.
Hi there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Do you think Pete the Cat will have a lot of fun when he goes to the library? Some yeses and some maybes, Bear. Well, this is Pete's first time checking out the library. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see all the places Pete sees and what he discovers. Pete the Cat Checks Out the Library by James Dean. Pete's mom is taking him to the library for the first time. The librarian gives Pete his very own library card. Cool, says Pete. The librarian smiles. Time for the tour. The librarian takes Pete through the library. There is a big desk where people wait to check out books. Pete sees some of his friends reading at a long table. It's very peaceful and quiet. How relaxing. The librarian takes Pete to her favorite room. There are lots of Pete-sized chairs and tables and shelves. There are books of every shape, size, and color. What do I do now? Pete asks. Now you read a book, the librarian says. Which book should I read? asks Pete. You can read any book you like, says the librarian. Pete looks around. There are so many books. Pete picks up a book all about airplanes and jets. He reads it and pretends he is a stunt pilot. He flies a super fast jet and does loop-de-loops and spirals high in the sky. Then Pete finds a book with dragons, wizards, and unicorns on the cover. He reads it and imagines that he is a powerful wizard using magic spells and a special wand to defend his castle against a fire-breathing dragon. Next, Pete opens a book about spiders and insects. He reads it and imagines that he is a scientist studying all types of critters in the wild. He has to be very still to study some critters and very fast to study others. Then Pete chooses a book with all sorts of scary monsters on the cover. It is a book of fairy tales. Pete reads it and pretends that he is in a dark, spooky forest trying to outsmart a big, bad wolf. Pete puts that book back on the shelf. It is too scary. Pete opens up a book about the pyramids in Egypt. He reads it and pretends that he is an explorer riding a camel across the desert and climbing to the top of a giant pyramid. Next, he picks a book with all sorts of robots on the cover. He reads it and imagines that he is a robot at a robot dance party. His arms and legs make whizzing sounds when he moves. When Robot Pete speaks, he says, bleep, bloop, bleep. Next, Pete picks up a book about superheroes. He reads it and makes believe that he is a superhero. He flies around the city in a colorful cape, chasing bad guys and saving the day. 
Then Pete spots a big book about the ocean and all its creatures. He reads it and imagines that he is a scientist in a submarine deep in the Atlantic Ocean looking for whales, squids, and sharks. There are so many wonderful books to read at the library. Pete can be whatever he imagines with a book. Reading is super groovy! Bear's wondering, did you like going to all those places with Pete? Yes, some of them. <laughs> did you imagine you were a robot at the robot's dance? Or did you ride in the submarine with Pete to see the whales? A lot of yeses, Bear. Well, is Pete right? Can you be anyone, anywhere you imagine with a book? Well, Bear hopes you come back soon for more magical adventures in books. Bye for now. Please subscribe. Hi there! You found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky and this is our friend Bear who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Have you ever gone camping and wondered if Bigfoot might be in the woods? Many are asking who is Bigfoot Bear? Well, Pete the Cat is wondering who Bigfoot is too. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see who Bigfoot is and if he's nearby. Pete the Cat Goes Camping by James Dean. Pete is excited to go camping. This is his first time. Don't forget your sleeping bag, says Dad. Or your hiking boots, Mom says. The campsite is deep in the woods. Mom and Dad set up the tent. Pete and Bob help collect sticks so they can make a fire later. Pete and Bob go for a hike. Bob shows Pete the footprints of different animals. Do you think we will see anything cool? asks Pete. Maybe, says Bob. Pete and his dad go fishing. They must be very quiet and very still to catch a fish. Fishing takes a long time. They finally catch some fish. Mom builds a fire. She cooks the fish for dinner. It tastes yummy. Next, Pete toasts marshmallows. Pete makes s'mores with chocolate and graham crackers. It starts to get dark out. Bob tells Pete a story about a scary, hairy giant. The giant lives in the woods. His name is Bigfoot. Do you think Bigfoot lives here? Asks Pete. No one has ever seen Bigfoot, says Bob. Don't let Bob scare you, says Dad. Bigfoot is not real, Mom says. Pete sighs with relief. But if he is real, I bet he's friendly, says Dad, and likes s'mores, too. That's not scary, thinks Pete. 
Maybe he wants us more. Pete leaves one for his hairy friend. Soon it's time for bed. Lights out, boys, Dad says. Bob and Pete share a tent. Pete gets into his sleeping bag. It is cozy, but he cannot sleep. The woods seem extra dark, and all the sounds seem extra loud at night. Pete hears a weird swooshing sound. What is that? he asks Bob. That's just the wind, says Bob. Pete hears an odd chirping noise. What is that? he asks out loud. Those are just the crickets. Pete hears a strange hooting sound. What is that? he wonders. That's just an owl. Pete thinks of his friend, Owl. Pete hears a loud snapping sound. Crack! What is that, he wonders. But Bob is already fast asleep. Pete listens carefully. Crack! Is it Bigfoot? Pete peeks outside. It is too dark to see anything. When Pete wakes up, he checks the spot where he left the s'more for Bigfoot. The s'more is gone! There is a note. It says, Thanks for the treat. XOXO. Pete shows his family. Wow, I knew Bigfoot was real, says Bob. Pete knows Bigfoot is not scary. Just because he looks different does not mean he is scary. He even likes s'mores too. Bear's wondering, do you like marshmallowy, chocolatey s'mores? Many yeses, but some haven't tried s'mores yet, Bear. Well, if Bigfoot had not eaten that s'more, Bear says he would have been happy to chomp it down and ask for some more. <laughs> Bear also hopes you come back soon for more outdoor adventures. Bye for now. Please subscribe. There, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Have you ever visited a firehouse to see what firefighters do? Some say yes, and some no, Bear. Well, firefighter Pete the Cat is asking if you'd come along with his class to the Cat firehouse. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see if someone will need rescuing. Let's go! Pete the Cat, Firefighter Pete by James Dean. We are going on a class trip today, says Principal Nancy. She leads the class to a bright yellow bus. Everyone climbs on board. I wonder where we are going, says Pete. They are going to visit the firehouse today. The bus parks next to the bright red firehouse. 
Pete and his classmates are excited. The firehouse is huge. It's so big it can hold two long red fire trucks and all of the firefighters equipment. The firefighters show the kids around. They give everyone a turn to ring the old brass fire bell outside the firehouse. Then all the kids take turns sliding down the firefighter's pole. Whee! Callie yells as she glides down. The firefighters allow the kids to try on their gear. Firefighters wear a lot of equipment. First, Pete puts on the heavy black overalls. Then, he steps into the tall black boots. A firefighter helps Pete put on the heavy yellow jacket. Finally, they place a hard black helmet on Pete's head. All this gear is very heavy. Pete can barely move. The firefighters allow the kids to explore one of the fire trucks. Callie sits in the driver's seat. She presses the horn. It's so loud that all the kids cover their ears. Then Pete turns on the sirens and lights. The sirens blare. Woo-wee, woo-wee. The lights flash red and yellow. Suddenly, a loud bell rings in the firehouse. Oh no, it's the fire alarm. There's a fire in town. Gear up, Pete. The firefighters scramble into their gear very quickly. Pete puts on his gear too. They all climb aboard the fire truck and turn on the siren and lights. Firefighter Pete and the firefighters are on their way. Woo-wee, woo-wee. The fire engine races through town and the lights flash round and round. A firefighter presses the horn. All the other cars move out of the way. There's the fire. It's hot and loud, but the firefighters know exactly what to do. They work together as a team to connect the fire truck to the fire hydrant. Then the firefighters also attach a long, heavy hose to the truck. Firefighter Pete gives the signal, and the firefighters turn on the water. Whoosh! The water gushes out very fast. Several firefighters must hold the hose to control it. Pete helps direct the hose as they spray the fire with water. The fire is starting to go out. There is smoke everywhere. Suddenly, Pete hears yelling from the roof. Oh no, it's Grumpy Toad. He needs to be rescued. The firefighters raise a long ladder from the truck. Crank, crank, crank. The ladder goes up and up and up. Firefighter Pete and another firefighter help Grumpy Toad climb down the ladder carefully. Yay! The fire is out and everyone is safe. The firefighters drive back to the firehouse. They take off all their gear. They pat Pete on the back and say, good job, Pete. Firefighter Pete helps save the day. Bear's wondering, do you think Grumpy Toad will want to give Pete a big thank you? Yes? Bear's saying, what a rescue! That was close! Bear's also asking, 
Would you like to be a brave firefighter someday and rescue people and animals from danger? Hmm, something to think about. Bear also hopes you come back soon for more adventures in helping others. Bye for now. Please subscribe. Hi there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Do you ever wish you could build a tree house up high in your favorite tree? Lots of yeses, Bear. Hmm, would you invite your friends to play in it? Yes? Well, Pete the Cat is building a tree house right now, and he's inviting all of his friends over. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see if Pete and his friends will have a tree house party. Pete the Cat and the Tip Top Tree House by James Dean. Pete the Cat has built a tree house. He calls his friends. I just built a tree house, he says. Come over to play. Pete's friends show up. This is great, say his friends. But it is a little small. You are right, says Pete. It is too small. I will fix that. Pete starts building a bigger tree house. Do you want some help? asks Callie. Sure, says Pete. Callie carries up more wood. Can I help too? asks Marty. Sure, says Pete. Together, they build a tower for Pete's tree house. Let's have a tree house party, says Marty. A party, says Pete. But what will everyone do? I can help with that, says Emma. This is great, says Pete. Let's do it. Pete, Marty, Callie, Emma, and Grumpy Toad get right to work. They build an arcade. They fill it with fun games. They build a bowling alley. It has 20 lanes. They build a wave pool. Pete can surf indoors. They build a movie theater and a skate park and a climbing wall and an ice rink. Pete's friends all come for the party. Pete takes one friend to the bowling alley. He takes one friend to the movie theater. Pete takes one friend to the skate park. Pete lets one friend surf in the wave pool. Is everyone here? asks Pete. Yeah, but 
We're all alone, his friends say. We came to play with each other. Oh, says Pete. Everyone, meet down at the jungle gym. Everyone climbs down. This tree house is amazing, say his friends. Thanks, says Pete. I'm so glad it brought us all together. Here's wondering, do you think Pete and his friends had fun planning amazing things to build? Yes. Do you also think they all enjoyed working hard? Yes. Bear's also asking, do you think good friends can always find ways to have fun? Well, Bear hopes you come back soon for more fun adventures in Friends, bringing friends together. Bye for now. Please subscribe. Hi there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky and this is our friend Bear who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Do you ever wish you could choose a puppy to pick up and take home with you? Wow, lots of yeses, Bear. Well, today is puppy pickup day for this little Labradoodle. He can't wait to meet his new family. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see if he is the kind of puppy you would want to take home. Puppy Pickup Day by April Cox. Today is the day. Wake up. Wake up. Today is the day, barked the littlest pup. Seven more puppies jumped from their beds as the little one yelled, Wake up, sleepy heads! Primping and fussing with hairbrush and comb, today all the puppies will get a new home. So eager and happy they ran off to play, excited and ready for their big day. When two of the doodles played tug with a rope, for the littlest pup, there wasn't much hope. When the others could jump, catching balls just for fun, the littlest pup couldn't catch even one. You're too small, the other doodles cried, as with a big thump. He fell off the slide. He sighed and he plopped himself under a tree, saw rabbits and said, Hey, you're little like me. Joining the bunnies, he ran and he raced. He wasn't too small to play tag and be chased. Under bushes and trees, over bridges they crossed. Then little pup yelped, Oh no, I am lost. I must get back, I cannot stay. Today is puppy pickup day. In the meantime, some families began to arrive. They each picked up doodles and then there were five. Aunt Nola Doodle said goodbye to each one as she patted their heads a few times, just for fun. Hello, said the puppy to Evie the cat. I have run a long way. How do I get back? Through the tall grass, she said, over the hill. Find a small stream and a bullfrog named Bill. 
he walked by the water looking for Bill, who was chasing a fly and wouldn't stand still. I must get back. I cannot stay. Today is Puppy Pickup Day. While the pup was wondering what he should do, three more were picked up, and then there were two. With grandkids excited, we just couldn't wait. We drove to meet up with our fluffy playmate. Grandpa and Carrie were singing a song, with Jackson and me clapping along. The pup saw his friend Abra as she came into sight, and he knew everything would be all right. I must get back. I cannot stay. Today is puppy pickup day. Then they heard giggles from kittens at play. Join us, they all said. It's a beautiful day. I must get back. I cannot stay. Today is puppy pickup day. Follow us to a shortcut, the pup's new friend said. He tried to hold tight, but fell right on his head. The littlest doodle ran back toward the gate. He squeezed under the fence, afraid he was late. I must get back. I cannot stay. Today is puppy pickup day. After a long and bumpy drive, his very own family was last to arrive. Could this new family love a clumsy pup? whose legs had trouble keeping up, who needed help after too many falls, failed at tug, and couldn't catch balls. He worried his family wouldn't like him at all, but he gave them a smile and tried to stand tall. He was dirty and scared and just wanted to hide. But he took a deep breath and he headed outside. Then Bella saw him. Look, here he is. Have you ever seen a face sweeter than his? All dirty, said Carrie, making a face. But Nola knew how to remove every trace. Into the tub, our puppy was plunged. Off came the grass and the mud with a sponge. As the dirt and the grime were then washed from his eyes, he clearly saw now that they loved his small size. Puppy pickup day at last was done with a final pat from Nola. Make us proud, little one. Welcome to the family. It's been quite a day. The first of many adventures coming your way. Bear's wondering, what do you think Brady's family liked about Brady? Hmm. Do you think his family liked the way Brady walked up to them, stood tall, and gave them a smile? Yes? Well, what did you like about Brady? Some are saying they liked the way Brady made friends with rabbits and kittens. Bear, what did you like? Bear liked the way Brady didn't give up on himself and kept trying to make new friends. Bear also hopes you come back soon for more adventures in trying to be friendly. Bye for now. Please subscribe.
Hi there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Have you ever heard of Raggedy Ann and Andy? A few have heard of their adventures, Bear. Well, Raggedy Ann and Andy just discovered a round white pebble, and they're asking each other if it could be a magic wishing pebble. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see if it is magic and if anyone else might want it too. Raggedy Ann's Wishing Pebble by Johnny Gruel. Raggedy Ann and Andy were rag dolls stuffed with nice white cotton. They had bright shoe button eyes and happy smiles painted on their rag faces. One day they were poking about by the looking glass brook when Raggedy Andy held up a round white pebble. Do you think this is a wishing pebble? he asked. I have no idea, said Raggedy Ann. Let's make a wish. Why don't we wish for something for our friends, the muskrats? Raggedy Andy asked. They always give us muskrat bread and butter when we visit. Raggedy Ann and Andy both squeezed the pebble as hard as they could, and Raggedy Ann said, I wish the muskrats had a magic soda water fountain right in their living room. They agreed that it was a good wish, and then they went to sleep in the sun. The dolls were awakened a little later by Freddy Field Mouse. There's a magic soda water fountain in the muskrats' home, he exclaimed. They're inviting everyone for ice cream sodas. He scampered off. That means the wishing pebble was real, Raggedy Ann said. Let's go see the fountain. She buried the pebble in the sand before heading off to the muskrats. Raggedy Ann and Andy found a crowd of animals at the muskrats' home, all drinking sodas. When the dolls told them about the magic wishing pebble, Mr. and Mrs. Muskrat thanked them for their kindness. Mrs. Muskrat snipped a hole in the center of each doll's mouth so they could try the sodas for themselves. Whee! Raggedy Ann cried after she and Andy drank 15 ice cream sodas. I don't believe I can drink another one. Let's go find the wishing pebble that I buried in the sand. That's a fine idea, cried Mrs. Muskrat. She and the other animals and the dolls ran to the brook. They hunted in the loose sand on the bank, but they couldn't find the wishing pebble. Mr. Muskrat had stayed home to wash the soda glasses but now he ran to join them. It's gone, he cried. The magic fountain just disappeared. Of course it's gone, a voice sounded from across the brook. Who is that? Raggedy Andy shouted. Ha ha, said the voice. I saw where Raggedy Ann buried the wishing pebble. I took it and wished the magic soda fountain would disappear from the muskrat's house. Now I have the fountain and the wishing pebble too. Mrs. Muskrat couldn't keep from crying. I had planned on all of our friends helping themselves to ice cream sodas from the magic fountain, she sobbed. Mr. Muskrat wiped his eyes. It's so nice to have a cold ice cream soda on a hot day. Don't cry, said Raggedy Ann. We'll get the pebble back. 
While the animals were comforting the muskrats, Raggedy Ann and Andy slipped away and crossed the brook. They got a little wet, but they soon dried in the sunshine. Do you know what? asked Raggedy Ann. I'll bet whoever has the wishing pebble can't make the fountain work because he is so unkind. Stop talking about me, said the mysterious voice. I'll bet you two old rag dolls are the reason my sodas taste like burnt candy. Raggedy Ann and Andy ignored the voice and walked along the bank, looking for clues to the missing pebble. Just as they passed under a large tree, a big checkered tablecloth fell down on top of their heads. Before they could untangle themselves, their feet were tied together by a little man with thin legs and a long nose. And when he spoke, they recognized the mysterious voice. It was Minky, who was known by everyone for his tricks and pranks. Ha, said Minky, I'm not letting you go until you tell me how to use the wishing pebble. I need a new magic fountain with soda that tastes sweet. Selfish man, Raggedy Ann laughed at Minky. The wishing pebble only brings good things when you wish for something nice for others. Suddenly, Minky let out a howl and fell onto the grass. Something is biting me! Tears streamed down his face as he got to his feet and ran away. There! Clifton Crawdad appeared suddenly, rubbing his big claws together. Minky filled my doorway with mud one day, and it took me a long time to clean it out. Now I've pinched him with my claws, so we're even. He quickly untied the dolls. Thank you, said Raggedy Andy. We'd better find Minky. It's no trouble, Clifton said, and burrowed back into his mud house. Raggedy Ann and Andy crossed the brook again and ran into Winnie Woodchuck. What happened? she asked. You're soaking wet. Come inside this minute. She hustled Raggedy Ann and Andy inside their home and Walter Woodchuck made them feel comfortable in front of the crackly fire. They sat and drank licorice tea and ate woodchuck cookies, which are made from twigs and hazelnuts. Suddenly the door burst open and Minky stopped inside. Give me those cookies, he shouted. Now you march right out, Mr. Minky, said Winnie Woodchuck. You are very rude. But before he could leave, Raggedy Andy said, That pebble belongs to us. He grabbed Minky by his jacket. Stop, Andy, cried Raggedy Ann. Now you're being mean. And when you're unkind, the wishing pebble won't work properly. That's why Minky's sodas aren't sweet. Raggedy Andy let go of Minky, and the little man ran out the door. It was quiet for a minute, then Raggedy Ann's shoe button eyes twinkled, and she whispered, I'll bet Minky is listening outside the window. Walter Woodchuck smiled. Let's go outside and look for the magic lollipop garden, he said loudly. Someone told me it's growing in the grass by the brook. The woodchucks and the dolls snuck down to the brook where Minky was crawling in the long grass. What are you looking for? asked Raggedy Ann. You know perfectly well, Minky replied angrily. Go away! The magic lollipops are mine! 
then he slipped in the muddy grass and fell into the deepest part of the brook. Minky couldn't swim very well, so Raggedy Ann held out a long stick to him and pulled him ashore. Why are you so kind when I was mean to you? The little man asked. Water dripped from his jacket and long nose. It was wrong of me to take your lovely wishing pebble. It's just that none of the animals like me. So I wanted to play a trick on them, he sniffed loudly. Raggedy Ann smiled. Don't feel sad, Minky, she said. She held out the wishing pebble, which had fallen from Minky's pocket. I just wished the soda fountain was back at the muskrats. And I wished for a lollipop garden in your backyard. I'll bet if you bring the muskrats some lollipops, they'll give you a soda and let you stay for dinner. They're really very nice once you get to know them. While Minky went to look for his new lollipop garden, Raggedy Ann and Andy decided to try one last soda at the muskrat's house. On their way home, they passed Minky digging in his garden. They waved goodbye and then left to join their friends in the nursery. Mary's wondering, do you think the magic would have worked if Raggedy Ann and Andy just wished for Minky to stop being mean? Some say no, Bear. They had to do something. Hmm. Bear's asking if sharing their magic with Minky helped him be kind. Many say yes, Bear. Well, Bear hopes the kind things you do will help others want to be kind too. Bear also hopes you come back soon for more adventures in being kind to everyone. Bye for now. Please subscribe.